And Lord, we need today to go well because we know that we are touching people's hearts. We are talking about the scripture that's going to be setting some people free. So Lord, I thank you for all that we're doing. Lord, may we we get this. And Lord, there is one thing that concerns me today and that is that people say, oh, I've already heard this and then not apply it. So Lord, I just need you to be touching our lives and showing us what we need to do today. And we just give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Well, we're going to get to the uh, get to the review. This is from from last week, and I've gotten all sorts of uh, very good reports from last week's message um, that it stirred up things. And <laughs> isn't that kind of like how I know I've done well is it stirs things up? Okay. So, ah, uh, yes, it is true. We've been talking about helplessness. We've been talking about all sorts, many different reasons for being helpless because people come into my office. People, I talk to them and they are helpless. And we already hit hopelessness a while back. This helpless one has really been good because we've been looking at the different reasons that people feel helpless. Okay, and so uh, one of them uh, is a problem we talked about last week. Um, people hide. They're hiding. Why are they hiding? They're, they're hiding for some reason. They don't want anybody to know how bad I am, how bad things are. I just don't want to, I want to hide. I want to keep this. And scrutiny is to be avoided at all cost. It is one of the reasons people just don't even make a, a an appointment in the first place. They're just, they're just afraid. No, I don't want to come in. I'd have to admit I was wrong. I have to, maybe they'll find sin in my life. Maybe there's something. So they, anyway, what is the real culprit? The culprit that we've been dealing with is shame. Now, I cut this thing down a lot from last week because I'm trying not to make, just reteach the whole thing over again. Um, but cr- shame is an incredibly strong emotional force. And man, once it hits somebody, uh, the idea behind shame is just, man, it is bad. It just, it really hits things hard. It's um, also greatly misunderstood. Um, For one, it can be easily dealt with, and few know that. Um, That's the part that makes fun for me is that, you know, once we find it is shame, okay, it can be dealt with fairly easily, okay? But the problem is that people don't know about shame. So one of the passages that I very, very much enjoy is Jeremiah 6.15. And it says, Were they ashamed when they made an abomination? Isn't that just a horrible sentence? They were not at all ashamed, nor did they even know how to blush. So they shall fall among those who fall. At the time I visit them, they shall be cast down, says Jehovah. You see, if they don't even know to blush, if they don't even have the shame, then they won't repent. They're not going to get away from it. So when the Lord visits them, they're not repentant. They're doomed. Okay? This is... They're going to fall. That's really, really bad. But that does sound like our present time. People don't know what shame is. and don't know what what they should be ashamed of. It's kind of interesting, I think. Um, don't even know how to blush. Now, I had kind of a separate problem with this, but it was a shameful thing anyway. And that is when I was... Growing up in high school, my dad learned that he could do something. He had a power over me. And um, he loved it. He thought it was just great. He would wait until I had friends around, and he would just look over at me and just point his finger and say, Lee, blush. <laughs> and I'd just turn bright cherry red, just boom, right there. Just And, you know, when you're blonde and white as I am, blushing shows up, you know, and it just... <laughs> He used that on me for literally years, and then uh, I got into college. He was at the dorm one day with a bunch of my friends all hanging around there, and and he looked over at me and he says, he says, guys, want to see some fun? Watch this, Lee, blush, and hit me like this, and it made me so mad. But I turned bright cherry red. But and he just laughed. Everybody laughed. It was a shameful thing. Okay, what was it? He had a, an authority over me. He ridiculed me in front of my friends. He always made me look, you know, look bad. It was a bad, bad thing. So I told him that day, I says, that's the last time. He says, what? Says, it will not work anymore after that. Sorry, just isn't going to happen. And so we were standing around something not too long later, and he says, Lee, blush. And I said, no. 
and I didn't. And he just kind of looked back like, whoa, and he, like, and so after everybody left, he came up to me and he said, I've never been so proud of you. He says, you conquered something. He says, this is the way it's supposed to be. It's just amazing. So it was just like, whoa. Well, it was something that had been a shame turned into a great value, okay? In kind of a twisted way, but jeez. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but I didn't know how to blush. Boy, I had it down to a fine science. Okay, moral standards, though, have been forsaken, okay? When I have to sit in here and convince a Christian that sex outside of their marriage is, is wrong, when I have to convince a Christian that pornography is sin, We've missed something, and I have had to do that so many times, it's just amazing, okay? So, I, we don't get it. And we do know that even now, so many call their shame pride. And they're what? They know there should be shame, and there isn't. And therefore, they call it pride. And they're trying to get away from it. And it doesn't work for me, it doesn't work for them. So, the problem. What happens when it becomes the reproach? What in the world is a reproach? Well, reproach is wearing shame like a garment. It goes beyond just something I've done that needs shame. It's becoming who we are. And I love that line from uh, uh, How to Train Your Dragons, where he he's talking about how bad his son is, and then he says, well, you know, like this. And the kid says, you just point motion to all of me. All of me. There was nothing I have that's good in any way, shape, or form. As you just post motion to all of me. That's when shame becomes our identity. When it becomes our identity, that's called the reproach. Okay, it's who we are and how we will always be. Um, I got that. Uh, mine became a reproach uh, when my my porn addiction became my identity. And it was bad enough to know that if anybody found me at it, the shame factor was off the charts. But the reproach was that inside me, I knew I couldn't get out of it. I was done. It was the reproach. It was who I was. I was a pervert. Okay? Bad news. How do you repent for something you are? You know? So it's, it makes it tough. How do you repent for being you? Yes. Well, amen. Uh, may not be something we actually did. Many reproaches are done by association, just who you're with or what family you're part of. Okay, you didn't do anything, but they did. Okay, they gave birth to you or something. I don't know. It's just that's that big. It's still a smear on our bearing, our being. Okay, we are the bad thing. We are not that we do. We are. It's a difference, uh, and which is the goal of most religion is to put us in a place where they control us by the shame and reproach, okay? Which is kind of, a, kind of sad. I'll throw a couple, a couple verses up here that I, I just, these are fascinating to me. When the wicked comes, scorn also comes, and with shame comes reproach. <laughs> yeah? You keep it up there, it will eventually be that way. Psalms 35, 26 says, Let them be ashamed and be confounded together, the ones who rejoice at my evil. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor, the ones who magnify themselves against me. I want to show you that clothed with thing, okay? Clothed with. That makes it a reproach, okay? It's a sentence of judgment. Shame is about what I've done. Reproach is about who I am. Now, both of them are bad. Now, there is a good shame. There is a good shame. Shame can be really good. Uh, it shows when there's a break in relationship. And when you feel the shame, you know that there's something between you that has been broken. And you go and deal with that shame, and then the, re the um, relationship is back. Okay? Uh, it's a, like a conviction of a sin. Only there's a shame factor involved. So a shame can be good or can be used, I should say, to bring us into a repentance. Okay? Condemnation of reproach is just because you exist. Now, none of this is good. Okay? There is a good shame. But God tells us His solution. The wonder of who He is and the wonder of what He does. Okay? 
I, I think it's just amazing. It sounds like he really understands. Does Jesus understand our shame? Okay, does he understand the reproach? <laughs> I think so. This is a good passage. Isaiah 53, 54, 3 through 4 says, For you shall break forth on the right hand and on the left, and your seed shall possess nations, and people will inhabit ruined cities. Do not fear, for you shall not be shamed, nor shall you be abashed, for you shall not be wounded. For you shall forget the shame of your youth, and you shall not remember the reproach of your widowhood anymore. I just love the way that says that because the idea of coming forth out of something is so really cool. Problem is, this is Isaiah. What is he looking forward to? He's looking forward to the time when Jesus would come and get rid of their shame and reproach. Uh, a new life free from shame and reproach in Jesus Christ. So free as to forget it. Um, if I didn't have to remind people um, like people who come in, people who I do ministry to, that I had 20 years in, in the porn, I would never bring it up. It's forgotten. It's not something that's part of me anymore. It's, it's cool. It's gone, okay? It's not, I am not a recovered sex addict. I'm not a sex addict. I am a freed person in Jesus Christ, okay? And then we talked about one of my favorite things, Joshua chapter 5. In Joshua chapter 5, Joshua, Moses was dead. He was bringing him into the land. And God says, tells him, take the people over to this place called Gilgal. Gilgal, translated roughly, means the rolling of the rolling. Huh? And he said, but God knew what he was doing there. And he says, because I will roll off the reproach of Egypt. They had always seen themselves as slaves. Always. But they had not circumcised anybody for 40 years of the wandering in the wilderness. And all the people who were older all died in the wilderness. So all of a sudden here you have all these people and they're 40 years and younger. But none of them had been circumcised except for two, Joshua and Caleb. So they counted, if you look in numbers, how many went into the land. 634,000, I think it is, men. It only counted the men. Told you that they're men who are between the ages of 20 and 40, old enough to go in the army. That's how they counted them. Okay, so here we have 635 men, uncircumcised. <laughs> the logistics is staggering, okay, to have lines and lines and lines of guys walking up to the priests. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Yes, well, this is one of the times you don't want to get in the front of the line. You want guys to get practiced a little bit, okay? <laughs> Sorry, just, that's one of those, I can't believe you said it's that my wife will talk to me about later. Okay, they still saw themselves, though, as slaves to Egypt, but after they got circumcised, they saw themselves as those who were in covenant with God. See the difference of how they saw themselves. Now, this people... Were 40 years and younger, <laughs> they were never slaves in Egypt. Mm. Isn't that funny? The reproach was generational. Ah, fascinating. Okay. Their sin put back into shame and reproach. Shame, the sin put them back into shame and reproach. We are no different. We go into that shame and reproach thing so quick, just so quick. So in 1 John 3, 19 through 21 is the New Testament version of how this thing works. I love this. In this we shall know that we are of the truth and shall persuade our hearts before him that if our heart accuses us, <laughs> we know that God is greater than our heart. And he knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not accuse us, we have confidence with God. I like this thing. If my heart is accusing me, what is that? Shame and reproach. Wow. But if my heart doesn't accuse me, I have confidence with God. I think this is absolutely awesome. We don't have to have this stuff. It's all about taking it to Him. That's what it's all about. Get healing of the hardness of heart. Got to bring that healing to it. Change how you see yourself. And this is the biggest deal. Is that One of the, the big things we did, we do with identity is we take somebody to the point where they have an identity that's bad. Well, what is that? Every single time it's a reproach. Every single time. Every addiction is a reproach. 
it's on you. It's how you see yourself. So our whole thing about dealing with identities is exactly dealing with reproach. Now, how many guys have we dealt with with the fornication thing where they had it on them? They had it on them. They were clothed in the shame of their their sin. What is that? It was the reproach. So to take them back to where it started, and the Lord takes them back there, and they repent, they go to the Lord and say, I did this, and He forgives them. They bless themselves. It changes everything. They come forward, and they can take it off and break its authority. No longer has covenant. Well, that's exactly what we've been doing. We've been breaking the reproach. I mean, is anybody with me on this? Come on. It's fascinating. Okay. It's going to snow. I know. It's okay. <laughs> Romans 8 1 says, Boy, I'm praising God, this verse is in the Word. There is therefore now no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to flesh, but according to spirit. We have the capacity to walk free from the reproach. Uh, we don't need that anymore. We don't need the, the shame and reproach kind of an idea. Only in Him is there freedom from reproach. Only in Him. Self, selfishness drags us back into the darkness. What is selfishness? That's all flesh. What is self, flesh? What is that? That's the darkness. That's what it's all about. Flesh is death. Spirit is life and peace. You know, it says that. For the mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the spirit is life and peace. It says that. That's right there in Romans 8. Yeah, I heard that somewhere. Yeah, it's in the Bible, right? It's in the Bible. Yes, who would have known? We play in very dangerous waters, okay? Guys, we we play with sin. We play with it. Maybe we just got to not do that. Now, there is good shame that we need. We talked about that. That's a shame that breaks a repro- uh, breaks a relationship, and it tells us that there's a problem. Okay, it lets us know when a relationship is broken, and there's also a good reproach. And when you start thinking of this, you go, "How can there be a good reproach?" Oh, yeah, there really can. We can put on Christ for all to see, and if they see Him as a reproach, then we are the reproach in Him. Okay, we look at it as, "I don't feel the reproach. I don't feel it bad," but to the outside. The world hates that. And uh, so what did Jesus say? Was, uh, well, they will hate you because, well, they hated me. So you're not better. It's going to happen. Uh, it's an honor to carry his reproach and therefore to be named by his name before other people. It's the shame factor put in the wrong place that makes us afraid of witnessing to people. Okay. We don't want them to think of us badly. But what does Jesus say? You know, we do. We want him to think of us badly. Okay, eh, it's kind of a kind of a big deal. Okay. But when Jesus doesn't see you as in a bad light, and your identity is seen through Him, then it doesn't matter how the world sees you because your confidence is in Him because your heart doesn't condemn you. That's the plan. That's the way it's supposed to be. It's like a good and bad chain, there's good and bad approach. That's exactly right. Exactly right. Hebrews 13, 12 through 13. Indeed, because of this, in order that he might sanctify the people by his own blood, Jesus suffered outside the gate. What? In order that he might sanctify the people by his own blood, Jesus suffered outside the gate. Let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. I, I, I don't know. It's just when it says it exactly, you know. <laughs> just like, yeah, there's a good reproach. It's in Jesus. God is calling us out. We are not to be normal to the world. Uh, uh-uh, that doesn't work anyway. They don't like our difference. They just don't. I was sitting in that surgery chair talking to these people who were going to be hammering on me, and they said, "So, you're saying that that your your uh, vitals and everything." are normal. I says, well, I don't know about everything being normal. My vitals are normal, but the, the what's normal, I mean, we want to start talking about normal. I got in a big discussion with them about what is normal. So they finally figured out that was not the right term to use. Not with you. Not with me. No. Nope. I got, I don't know, normal is... <laughs> yeah, that's about it. Okay. Until... Not anymore. Until they see the need of it, 
they won't like our difference. But boy, when they do see the need of it, then they're looking for us. Okay. Brad Paisley has a song, Those Crazy Christians. And he talks about how they're always, and he says, they, they're doing anything just to find another excuse to make a casserole, to, you know, go help people, do this sort of stuff. And he says, but when a push comes to shove, everything really happens, you know who I'm going to go to? Those crazy Christians. So it's just kind of a neat song. Okay. Let Jesus show you your shame and reproach, and therefore let him show you the truth. What is the truth? Let forgiveness and cleansing be your basis. I just think this is just too much fun. See yourselves as Jesus sees you. Wouldn't that be fun? Oh, well, well, just take off the old man. Put on the new. Oh, we've been here before. How cool is that? It's an identity issue. Don't let shame or reproach limit you from him. And that's what people do when they won't, won't go to another Christian for healing is they let their shame and reproach keep them from their relationship. Okay? But it's going to feel really bad to go to somebody and tell them the sin I've been in. It would go one step further. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross despising the shame. Who for the joy set before you endure the, the shame of this. And you'll get away from it. And it's just kind of a big deal. Come to the light to become light. That's the way it should be. Therefore, God wants us close to him. What a concept. We can't be all that bad. God wants us close to him. Right? He has great value in us. What is our value? And again, how do you determine the value of anything? It's what somebody else will pay for. What's the value of you? Well, God paid Jesus to get you. I think that value makes you high. All religion is false. He wants the true stuff. He doesn't want the false stuff. He wants the true stuff. So... He has done it all for us. Praise God. Was that a fun review? Okay. Now, that was that was again the the full one has more stuff in it. You can get that from last week and it's on the website. Okay? It's all there and good to go. Yep. Amen. What's your website? Huh? And what is your website? My website is m the one about me. It's no, it's, I'm getting there. Uh, I do that just for that look. See that look? That was, okay. Um, my website is face to face healing ministries, ministry, face to face healing ministry.com. Resources tells gives all my messages. This one is on helplessness. Go in there and find it. Last week was on shame. There you go. Here we go. We're getting ready to jump in. When somebody comes in and they say, or if I'm just talking to somebody at a conference or at a party or just something, and they say stuff like, well, everything's just bad. Hmm. Well, how do you deal with everything being bad? <laughs> okay. When you're trying to deal with somebody and, you know, one thing at a time, but when they tell you, Everything is bad. What? they would like, well, okay, now what do you do? And, just, and they'll say stuff like, everything I touch turns to mud. You're just all bad. It says, everything I touch turns to mud. So their life is uh, like there's a cloud that follows them. Okay? Mm -hmm. There used to be a guy like that in an old comic strip. Andy Cap had a guy that followed around and he had a thundercloud that just followed him out everywhere he went. Okay. Uh, in Peanuts, there's Pigpen. And Pigpen created a dust storm everywhere he went. Okay. This is a kind of a, a problem. Is Somebody has that. Well, there's negative thinking in absolutely everything they're thinking. It's just always, it's always bad. Now, I've even had people say this. I feel like I'm just cursed. Mm hmm. Hmm. Well, maybe they are. <laughs> they, they may not have had a bad assessment. Okay? Uh, curses are very real. I think we just found out the subject matter for today. Okay? What's the subject matter today? Curses. Is there such a thing? Oh, boy, is there. 
and it's not something to ignore. <clears throat> you mean I can be walking around and somebody can have cursed me? Yeah, it's a possibility. There is power out there. Or, or yourself, or whatever. Anyway, we'll, we'll discuss all that, okay? So a lot of you have heard, heard me teach on this before, and you've heard this. It doesn't hurt to hit it again, especially in the verses we're going to, okay? But in Deuteronomy, chapter 30, 14 through 20, and right now I should just let Jennifer come over and teach the rest of this. <laughs> She's heard this a few times, huh? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. You going to come over and teach it for me? <laughs> no, that's, it's okay for you to come over and teach it? It's no, okay? It's okay for you to <laughs> <laughs> Are you backpedaling? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, someday, Jennifer. Okay. Someday, all right. <laughs> Verse 14 through starts, it says, For the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. And I am not going to get into that, which I normally do. I get into that pretty heavy. But it says, Behold, I have set before you today life and good and death and evil in that I am commanding you today to love Jehovah your God to walk in his ways and keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments and you shall live and multiply and Jehovah your God shall bless you in the land where you're going in to possess it now this is Moses talking and he's talking to the children of Israel this is Deuteronomy 30 this is the last of the books of Moses this is the last chapters of the books of Deuter Deuteronomy this is his last soliloquy his last entreaty into the children of Israel his last sermon what do you say the last thing before you die that you're going to do to prepare, prepare people for all that's before them okay this is Moses's problem right now this is his problem so he tells them, he says, the word is very near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. Now, we know, if we've studied Romans at all, that Paul, who wrote Romans, quotes this. He says, and as Moses says, okay, in Romans chapter 10, the word is near you in your mouth and your heart that you may do it. Okay, he quotes this, because, but he changes it slightly in Romans, okay, because he knows now he is trying to tell people that they have the Holy Spirit within them. And there's a neat changes in that. But the principles are still the same. These people do not have the Holy Spirit living within them. But the principles are still principles that are strong. He says, I have set before you today. I'm telling you this exact thing. You have life and good or death and evil. He says, you have all these things set before you. In that I am commanding you today to love Jehovah your God. Now, can you use death and evil to love Jehovah your God? Probably not. Okay? Can you use life and good to love Jehovah your God? Yeah. So you say, I'm putting these things before you so that you may love the Jehovah your God. That's the idea. And to walk in his ways and to keep his commands and his statutes and his judgments and you shall live and multiply. And Jehovah your God shall bless you in the land where you're going in to possess it. If... You follow life and good and don't follow death and evil. Okay? He's pretty, pretty adamant about it here. Okay? And then he says, he gets personal. Mm -hmm. He says, but if you turn away your heart and you do not listen and are drawn on, even you will bow down to other gods to serve them. I declare to you today that you shall certainly perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land in which you are crossing the Jordan to go in there to possess it. This is simple. Guys, this is simple. Do it right and you'll get blessed. Do it wrong and you're going to die. Okay? You play with death and evil and you're going to get death and evil. And then, uh, I, what part of this is, just sounds so tough? You know? Why does this sound like it's, you know, rocket science or we should say rocket surgery or brain science instead of, you know, whatever. Anywho. Okay? The issue is it's still, this is simple. Not necessarily easy. But it is simple. The issue was their heart. What are you going to do with your heart? Okay. Well, what you do is always your choice. Now, he does say this. I'm setting these things before you today. So you will know how to get this thing done. And then he jumps in. The last part of that, and he says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today. Now, before I go any further, I absolutely love this. Because he says, I'm calling heaven and earth as witness. In other words, I am calling on the, the properties of the spirit realm and the physical realm to show you evidence 
of the truth of this. Okay, you can see it in the spirit realm. You can see it in the physical realm. This thing's I call heaven and earth as witness against you today. Okay, that to me is so vastly important because we have a tendency to look at the physical and we don't see the spiritual stuff that's hanging around us. Okay, that's right back to the thing we talked about a while back on you don't know the truth and you don't know the truth. Okay, you don't know the truth who is Jesus. Is he standing right next to you? If you don't know that, then you're always looking to see if you can contact him. Or he's out there. Do I pray right? Do I act right? Am I going to get Jesus involved? Man, we've missed it. He's right there. Okay? He's always with you. No religion. And you don't know the truth. The truth is, there's more to this world than what you see. There's greater things. Man, there's more to it. What is happening around you? Well, he's setting them up. He says, well, if you walk into death and evil, you will have set yourselves under the frequencies and the principles of death and evil. If you walk in life and good, you have set the frequencies and the principles of life and good. You will get the one you choose. Just very simple. He says, but I call heaven and earth as a witness before you today that I've set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. And he changes the list. Not really. He just kind of condenses and adds to it. You have life and good, which is now under life. And you have death and evil, which is now under death. And then he adds to it the blessing, which is the good and life part, and the curse, which is the evil and death part. They are both principles of speaking things into existence. The one is speaking things into a good existence, and the other is just speaking things into a horrible, rotten existence. Okay? Well, it's all done by the power of the tongue, the power that we speak. I have taught this now, wow, how many years? Long time. Long time. And yet, it's like every time I bring it up, it's the first time. People are still going, oh. And we've gotten to the point where we're getting it intellectually, but we're still not applying it physically and spiritually. We've got to know that this thing is true. Okay, our power of how we speak, the power of what we say, okay, just absolutely amazing. You are made in the image of God. First time we see God in the Bible, what's He doing? In the beginning, God created. He's creating. That means you're creative, you are a creator. Absolutely. How did God create? He create, created by speaking it into existence. How do we get things to happen? We speak them into existence. That is such a, a simple logic. It really is. It's a simple process of logic to get it right down. And yet we'll, we'll walk out and we'll still blast things with our mouth. We're just not paying attention as much as we should. Now, I did a dumb thing. Preparing for today's message, I went through my entire teaching on the blessing. That was probably not the smartest thing I've ever done. But also this week, if you'll notice sitting right up there on my little thing, is I've been working on the face-to-face -face manual book. So what chapter am I writing about right now? Blessing and curses. I have been drowning this week in the blessing and curses. Okay, it's just been a constant thing on my mind, on my head, walking around, doing different things. Okay. Sitting in an oral surgery room this, this last Friday. Okay. I got three students. There's not even an instructor in there. And they're going to start opening me up and jerking teeth out of my mouth and cutting things and everything else. And so I'm sitting there going, okay, let's think about this for a second. <laughs> I don't know who they are, but I do know who I am. Okay? So I'm going to bless me. I'm going to bless me in mighty ways. I bless them. I bless them with being able to have wisdom. I bless them with knowing what they're supposed to be doing. I bless them with steadiness at hand. Uh -huh. I bless them with knowing what's going on and how and why. And I mean, I'm just sitting there just blessing the whole room and I'm just blessing with light. There's no darkness in that room. I, I think a Satanist would walk in their room and pass out. Just, you know, I think it's just, it'd be, it was really fun as I was having fun emanating life, peace, light, 
from sitting in that chair, okay? Come on, guys, this is good stuff. It's fun, okay? Otherwise, you get into fear, you get into pain, you get into whatever. Uh, I think this is absolutely fascinating. The blessing is you create this stuff on what's going on around you. You create it. Uh, what do you have? How many times you say, well, I'm having this, I'm having this problem, this problem, this problem, this problem, this problem, and you've just spoken into existence the problems and established them in your life. Okay? Do we do this even after we've been taught? Yeah. Yeah, we do. Okay? Do a I do this? Less than we used to. A little, little less, yes, than we used to. Praise Girl. God. Okay? And so it's something that still is always on my mind, is what have we spoken into existence? How negative do we get? We get so negative in our thinking about certain things that's happening, and you just, bad, this bad, this bad, and we curse it. Bad news. And here comes the fun part, another good part about this. I have said before you, life and death, the blessing and the curse, therefore, choose life. And again, what he didn't say here is as important as what he did say. He said, choose life. What he didn't say is choose between life and death. He didn't have to say choose between life and death because death is default setting. Since the fall of man, death is constant. Death is the, just like gravity. It's always there. The evil is always there since the fall of man. We've had sin around us in every way, shape, and form. Okay? It's always there. It's a constant. Hmm. Meaning what? He says, now, therefore, choose life. Because we are the only ones who have the ability to choose life because we know Him. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Hmm. So He's not just the truth as in knowing the truth, but now we have to also understand we need to know the life. And what do we have to do? Choose life. I, you know? <laughs> so when people come in and they're sitting there and they just say, it's all bad, I'm, I'm going to die. You know? It's all, okay. Yeah, what has happened? They are. I don't deal with unbelievers. So these are Christians who are coming in here and who are completely consumed in negativity. Completely consumed in the damage. And we're going to talk about that as we go on. Therefore choose life that you may live, you and your seed, to do what? To love Jehovah your God. That's our goal. That's our plan. That's what our life purpose is. Thank you. To listen to his voice and to cleave to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, so that you may live in the land which Jehovah has sworn to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give it to them. He's saying you can have, you can, you sure may, if, if it's too, and uh, he's leaving. Okay. He might be back. He might. You should have heard him yesterday. He was winding up everything. Wow, wow. Just, you couldn't, I couldn't hear my radio right there. I couldn't, it was, it was so loud. Uh, you want to turn on the thing. We closed up everything here. So, back to our subject matter is what about life? Choosing life, okay? We've got to not curse. And the blessing and the curse is the weapons that we have been given to promote life or death. To promote good or evil. We make that work. By the way, while we're talking about this, he does, why did he get rid of when he said life and death, why did he get rid of life and good, death and evil? Why did he get rid of good and evil? This is a simple little thing. When you're talking to people about what they've done in their life, if you say what they've done is evil, they'll shut you out, they'll fight you tooth and nail, they'll just, nah, 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 how dare you call me evil, and they just beat me so mean. But if you say what you're doing is death, is causing death. It's, it's killing you. Really? And they talk about it and it's just it's like, okay, so what he's giving here is his life and death. If you bring that up to people, they'll be more consistent with being able to understand what you're doing rather than good and evil. If you tell somebody they're evil, they will fight you. If you tell them that it's killing them, they go, really? Okay, so just change that. I just thought I'd let you know about that. Okay. The choices are clear, but not well known. <laughs> our culture is to curse. It is part of our culture to curse. Blessing is foreign. It's a completely foreign thing. They, people don't know how to bless. That's kind of like, what's that? Okay. 
it is so common as to be as not be noticed okay people don't know there's no blessing they just walk in curse it just is like it's a solid it's a constant the truth and the truth I've been bringing this up okay what is the truth if Jesus is standing next to you how are you going to talk you're going to talk in blessing or curses okay kind of an amazing deal okay if you understood the spirit realm around you and could see, if only, for 10 minutes, if we could just see the effect coming out of our mouth and what it affects in the spirit realm, if we could just see that 10 minutes, it would change your life. Absolutely change your life. Change mine. It would change all of us. If we could just get a discernment up to where we could see the spirit realm around us and saw the effect of what our mouth was saying. Uh, there was a man, Neville Johnson, I believe was his name, out of Australia. And the Lord started letting him see colors coming off of people. And it was absolutely, he for, he for, for a while, for the first couple of weeks, it was fascinating. And then it started getting overwhelming and got sickening. But he could see the colors that would emanate from them when they talked, as they did stuff. And you could tell the difference between negative colors and positive colors. You could see a vibrancy of a beautiful red as opposed to a dark red that was affecting. Okay, you could see a difference between the two realms of colors. And he was just like, that's really... And then the Lord just upped it a little bit and let him smell them. And he, he says that he just begged, begged the Lord to shut it off. He couldn't handle it. He says, I've never, he says, even to this day, just thinking about envy makes him sick to his stomach. He wants to puke. Because he says envy has the most horrible smell to it. And he, he was able to see the colors coming off of people. Now, that's only a little bit of the discernment that you could get in the spirit realm if you knew it all. What's his name? Neville Johnson, I believe. Okay. But, anyway, so he, he had a hard time with, with, he just begged the Lord to shut this thing off. And I understand. But we've got to start getting more discerning about what's going on around us. Um, there are spiritual forces at work. We need to know that. We were made in the image of God and therefore have the power of creation. We can change things with our mouth. We can cause things to exist. And of course, what's the spiritual force of causation? Faith. Faith. It's a force of that causes things to change. So you speak with faith and it changes things. Ah, oh, come on. Now, if you go, we also understand that what happens when your faith goes negative, what's that called? Fear. Fear. So if you're starting to speak fear, what are you doing? You are speaking a creation of fear. You are creating the curse. Boom. Am I giving a good picture here? It's, I'm thrilling myself here. I'm hoping somebody's kind of like walking along with me on this one. Okay, this is the power of creation. Okay. Several things to know that are important, okay, as we start talking about the curse, is that there are three major ways to be cursed. And there are more, okay, but I'm going to go with these. Okay, I'm going to talk about these three today. Okay. we got to be aware of them as the first step to help. If we're going to be doing this stuff, we're going to know how... The curses, actually, three different ways of cursing, okay? Uh, these are true in other people. <coughs> it's not just about us. This is true in others and how we affect others, okay? They are true in ourselves. Our awareness is crucial. And again, our discernment level has got to be increased and increased and increased. And the Lord has not allowed me to teach on discernment. I've looked at it several times and he's just uh, this is not time. We'll get there. We will get there. But the highest principle in warfare and victory is right here. It's what we're going to be doing in cursing and blessing. It's one of the highest principles in warfare and victory. So use your weapons well. Here we go. The number one is the spoken curse. Okay? Uh, what you say with your own mouth. Uh, that's kind of an amazing deal. Or what is said to or about you by others. You can hear this. It's spoken. Okay, It's something that's spoken to you, by you, something. The spoken curse. It's a bad news deal. The lives that have been spoken and received. You know when somebody says, you're worthless. Was that a blessing or a curse? curse. Well, it's a curse. Okay, hello. You know, and But they spoke it. 
Okay, how many times do we have to go back? Every single time in Theophosics, when you go back to the lie, you hear a lie and you go back, and Lord, were you taking back where that first started? Every time somebody spoke that lie, that was a curse. And that curse was the f effect of that sin against them. Interesting, huh? I don't know if we've ever quite stated it that way before, but that's all good. We don't understand the importance of word on how to speak. Flippant, non-caring words cause damage. You got to be careful. The principles still work whether you know them or not. True. You know? If you don't know the principles behind how gunpowder is ignited <laughs> and how it expands quickly and it, it, it goes down, you don't understand the principles behind it, it doesn't matter, you can still shoot somebody. Yeah. Okay? That somebody is you. Yeah. Right. Doesn't matter if you know the principles. They work, whether they, you know them or not. So we are held accountable for our words. Our words are very, very, very important. Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the hand of the tongue, and those who love it shall eat its fruit. Death and life are in the hand of the tongue. The tongue manipulates death and life. Did you notice in this verse, the default setting is talked first. Death and life. Okay. You have the power to speak life or death. You got the power. Into whom? Everyone. <laughs> Whether they think they're receiving it or not. They're affected. They are affected. Why were we given such a great responsibility? Hmm. We have this authority on the earth. And he says, now, use it correctly. We are the only ones who can use it right here. You know, an unbeliever cannot speak blessing. Not with the power that you do. They can speak good things. Can't they? Sure they can. Can they bless to that degree? No. Why? They don't have the Spirit of God behind what they're saying. You follow me on that? That's a good point. That's a very good point. I want you to repeat. After. That's a good point, Lee. That was a good point. I'm going to mark it on the calendar. Okay, you just do that. You're a weirdo. Okay. How about Matthew chapter 12, 35 through 37 says, The good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. The evil man out of the evil treasure puts forth evil things. But I say to you that every idle word, whatever men may speak, they shall give account of on judgment day. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. I think it's fascinating that this first starts off and says, the good man out of the good treasure of his heart puts forth good things. Well, wait a minute. Do we not know there's a connection between the mouth and the heart? How do you put forth good things out of your heart? Well, you speak them. Evil man puts out, evil treasure puts forth evil things. And then immediately he says, every idle word. See, he's talking about speaking. How do you get the things out of your heart into other people? You speak them into existence. You promote them by blessing or curse. But I say to you, every idle word, whatever man may speak, they will give account of in judgment day. That scared the pee-wadden out of me when I was younger. And it still scares me. Okay, every idle word. You ever spoke to something when you were alone? And we're glad that nobody else was around <coughs> to hear what you said? Anybody ever hit their, ha their thumb with a hammer or burn their arm or... Just thought I'd bring that one up. Hey, you know, not one single word came out of my mouth. That's good. You were... <coughs> Pretty much. <laughs> <air> going in. <laughs> okay. So, uh, we got to be careful, man. Uh, every idle word, man, the things we speak so quickly, so flippantly, bad news. You bring out treasure by how you speak. I can tell what's important in your heart by how you talk. Held accountable for every word spoken. That's big. Now, I just have noticed I made a mistake here, and this is going to be good. Number two. <laughs> the generational curse. Oh, made a little glimmer there. That's all good. The generational curse. Distinctive for every, each and every family. Okay? My dad had the same problem. 
It's a curse that happens on somebody. They come in and they have it, and they just they've always had it. It's just something like they go back. My dad had the same problem. Well, heart disease runs in our family. Okay, because I've done medical things lately, I've had to go into the doctor, and they've had to do what? Give me all these forms that you have to fill out. Anybody ever remember any of the? F yes. You have to go early so you can fill out all the stupid forms. Okay, they are asking you to curse yourself. <laughs> Please so. curse yourself in the following checkbox. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want heart disease? Then admit to me and c c curse yourself with having heart disease in your family. Okay? No, I don't. I just don't. You say, well, wait a minute. Is there heart disease in your family? No. Have people in your... F no, not in this family. Now, I died to that old family. Now, the other ones that had all the problems, they had cancer and heart disease and f kidney failure. And you just name it. They're all they're a bunch of losers. Okay, but that I died to them. Do you think that also you can like not believe it and therefore not receive it? Do you know what I'm saying? I don't believe it and therefore I don't receive it. I mean, like, let's say somebody has that, but can they like, oh, okay, yeah, my mom, my mom or whoever had that, but that doesn't mean anything. Exactly, but that's exactly what I'm trying to get at. Is that I don't receive it. Yeah. Okay. I don't put it down. I just, I just, not me. Okay. That's not my family. I am now born into a whole new family, and Jesus does not have cancer. Amen. Okay. So I just, I don't take that as I don't receive that. Listen, the Johnsons are all stubborn. Okay. Now we can. Put in your name here. Get fill in the blank instead of Johnson's. Okay, what's it say about your family? What have people said about your family? And how much have you gone with what they said about the family? Okay, mercy day. Okay, how about, and I've heard this one, I'm becoming just like my horrible father. And they didn't put the word horrible. They it implied it. I'm becoming just like my father. And they say it with such disdain. I'm becoming just like my father. <laughs> Yeah, no, you do not have to. Okay, that's a curse. That's the generational curse. My whole family is against me. Now, that's another way of the family curse going against you. Where you and this happens with people who are the only Christians in their family. Okay, they get shot at pretty good. It's not about family anyway. Yeah, that's right. I've always been like this, and I can't change. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Another way of knowing it's generational is if somebody has a uh, a memory that you're you're dealing with in a situation, and you say, "Lord, you take them back to that memory," and they go in the womb. Mm. Okay, that's before they could have made a choice. So, what is it? Generational curse. Okay, it's it's the curses spoken on them or spoken to them in the womb or whatever. They've been cursed. Okay, it's beyond their ability. A generational curse is easily dispelled. It's very easily dispelled. It really is. Uh, when you were born again, you died to Adam, your old man Adam. You died to that whole thing. So it must become revelation to you, though. You know, we've done this so many times that people, we've, we walk them right through stuff. But folks, if it isn't revelation, then it's just technique. I don't want technique. I don't want methodology. I want revelation. When somebody say yes, and I am born again, and I am not of that family, and they declare it, and they break it, that is too cool. Or you can just do the normal, everybody say, <laughs> and nobody gets free from anything. Okay, it's not about your religion, and you quote, repeat after me. You know, how many hail marys can you do? <laughs> Stand in the mirror and tell yourself, you are loved, you are special. You do that 18 times a day for six months, and it'll break generations. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you were born again into a new family. What do you think born again means? Born from above. John chapter 3. Study it. Okay. It's very important. Okay. Old man and old ways are dead in Jesus. Mm -hmm. We can be free from that whole family. Now, if there's something that you want to get rid of the family thing and you want somebody to walk you through that, I'll do that with you. It's simple. It doesn't take much time, but man, it's got to be your revelation. It can't be just technique. Uh, your new family isn't cursed. <laughs> we look around and say, huh, these are the new family members and, uh, and your new family isn't cursed. Okay. 
But it isn't automatic. You have to appropriate. People just say, just because I got born again, now I don't have the curses. No, you have to actually appropriate it. You have to actually do something with it. It's not just automatic. Faith is the function of our whole new family. Okay? And just like the last one was number two, number three. I got the three right on this one. At least I changed it on the PowerPoint. Good boy. Right. Two out of three ain't bad. <laughs> The most common curse. Now, everyone knows I'm going there. Everybody knows what I'm going to be doing. Everybody. Everybody knows. Jeremiah 17, 5 through 6. And it says, <laughs> So says Jehovah, Cursed is the man who trusts in man who makes flesh his arm, who turns aside his heart from Jehovah. For he shall be like a juniper in the desert and shall not see when good comes. But he shall live in parched places of the wilderness and a salt land that is not inhabited. That verse 6 just tells a description of what it's like to be in verse 5. Verse 5 is the person who trusts themselves. They're cursed. They cannot see when good comes. They're always so busy being their own God, they can't see good. They're always trying to change things. You live in a parched place in the wilderness and salt land. There's no provision there. You live in a place that's not inhabited. How lonely is that? Okay, you can just see how, how damaging this thing is. Well, this verse seems to be my theme song, okay? Uh, it's right there, and it's right over there. It's on my walls in two places, okay? It's just like, this is the one. And well, as soon as I bring it up, which is kind of funny, my Bible that sits on my desk right here, I, I tell people, just turn to the ribbon. And they go to the ribbon, and there's Jeremiah 17. Right? What's kind of funny is, right after that I go to... Proverbs 3 5, and my Bible flops open to Proverbs 3 5. Okay. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your understanding. You have to trust God and get your head out of the way. It seems to be a theme song. But we still do it. Okay. We still curse ourselves. Okay. Trusting myself makes me my God. Not a good God. I'm telling you right now. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And if I'm just so proud that I am the one controlling my life, that means not only am I my own God, but I have God opposing me. <laughs> Talk about your basic curse, okay? That's just, that's bad, okay? If I trust me, I have every right to be afraid. I uh, really. Or anybody else. Uh, yeah, this is this is really really bad. You would think we would know this by now. You would think this is the most common form of cursing. But others haven't known to know it. We've got to promote this. We've got to tell the people. We've got to tell other people what's going on. We've got to go out there and say, oh, "Don't do that." You say, "Well, I can't think of the reference." If you can't remember Jeremiah 17 by now, I don't even know what to tell you. Okay. It's <laughs> even Jennifer remembers the verse, right? Right, you know, right? Yeah, I wouldn't admit it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to bless you here, okay? Just it's a blessing you with remembering it. It's okay. Okay, I remember. Okay, good. <laughs> we need to tell this to Christians. We need to tell this to people around. We need to tell that guy in the mirror once in a while. We can't have it both ways. You can't trust in God and trust in you. He doesn't. He, he, we do it. We, we bounce back and forth. And that's uh, Trust is a relational issue. If I don't know that Jesus is standing next to me, how can I trust him? If I'm just thinking that my religion has to get me to the point where Jesus is going to actually pay attention to me and love me and bless me because I've done the right things, then I will never trust him. You follow me? Okay? Man, religion will kill you. Every second of the day, you can't be just, uh, we do this on Sundays and we do this on some Wednesday nights or some, you know, Monday night being no grace night. I don't know if I can bring that up. Okay. But how else will we hear what he speaks to our heart if we're not listening to him every second of the day? We know he's there. Trust in the Lord. Don't trust in you. This is how we access the blessing is by hearing him, trusting him, speaking what he speaks. It's always been about him, hasn't it? Yeah. So it should be. We have to speak it all out with power. Okay, we got to speak it all out with power. And then 
one of the funnest principles on the word. As the wandering bird and as the swallow is flying, so the causeless curse shall never come. I love this. This is spiritual physics. Man, this is exactly what this is. Okay? A curse tunes, a cursor tunes himself to curses. If I'm a cursor, I am tuned to curses. Therefore, a curse can come to me. If I'm a cursing person, curses just follow the pathway. Just very simple. A, a blesser, however, has different frequencies. Completely different. Okay? We can't afford to curse. We just can't afford it. It just isn't right. Okay? <coughs> Placing a guard over our mouth and heart. Okay? A curse without cause cannot land. If I'm a cursing person, that curse has cause. If I'm a blessing person, the curse has no cause. It's a causeless curse. It cannot land. It can never come. It cannot land on me. Now, I've told people many times, don't curse me. Whatever you do, don't curse me. That's not because of me. That's not me trying to just say, save myself hassles because your curse is going to be so powerful. No, I'm saying that to save your life. Because a curse that you speak at my direction cannot land on me. The curse will have to go somewhere. It's coming back to you. Return to sender. Yeah. And if you're a cursing person, you're tuned to the cursing. Therefore what? You've just cursed yourself with extra added benefit. There. You just messed yourself up. Don't curse me. Just don't do it. It will mess you up. Okay? Why? Because I'm a blessed little kid in Jesus Christ. Okay? And as long as I am walking in blessing and speaking the blessing, curses just ricochet off. Man, it's t way much more power than that. Okay? Matthew 5, 43 through 45 says... You have heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I'm saying to you, love your enemies. <laughs> Bless those cursing you. Oh, do well to those hating you and pray for those abusing and persecuting you as you may become sons of your Father in heaven. You see, it's not enough to bless those that bless you. But if somebody is going to curse me, why do I bless those that curse me? Oh, because I'm saving their life. And, and if you don't, you have just deemed them worthy of judgment, which makes you a judger, which puts you in cursing, which means you end up getting cursed. <laughs> I think you got the point. Yes, sir, you do. Okay. This is absolutely huge. Okay. I bless those who curse me to save their life. It's about saving them. Because if they're going to curse me, this curse is coming back on them. They're going to need a blessing. They're going to need it badly. Bless those who curse you. We change the whole atmosphere change the whole thing. Okay, so got to got to get that on. Romans 12:14. This is too good. Bless those persecuting you. Bless and do not curse. So what part of that is not understood? I think that's, that's a pretty simple statement, okay? Bless those persecuting you. Bless and do not curse. Do not curse. Quit it. Stop it. Knock it off. Quit it. Stop it. Is not going to help you to curse. Okay? Since we are the children of God, we do what is common to Him. We are here to bless because He's the blesser. Cursing isn't becoming to us. It's not pretty. It's not pretty on us at all. So, and then He stops it with a command to not curse. So, what do we do with all these? Okay, the three curses: the spoken curse, the generational curse, the trusting curse. Hey, okay, what do we do with them? Well, that's just it. All curses are breakable. Hallelujah, Hallelujah is right. The spoken curse needs repentance and truth. It just does. You need to speak truth. You need to repent for doing that. You need to get that thing clean. Clean that mouth off. The curse of generations needs a declaration. It needs us to actually declare this thing and tell who we are. Boom. Very, very simple. The trust curse needs to be reversed. Just needs to be reversed. Who are you going to trust? It needs repentance. It needs truth. It needs a declaration. It needs it all. Jesus is the blesser. So the issue is 
don't fight him. Flow with him. <laughs> okay? So if we're looking at ourselves being helpless, when people come in helpless, helpless because they're being cursed is easy to stop. Easy. You just have to bless them. Break the curse and go for it, okay? Change how you operate. Change it. Learn the power and the peace. Everybody flowing with me? Has this been fun? It's been fun for me. <laughs> we aren't helpless. There's no need for curses anymore. No need for it. Blessings are much, much better. Great spiritual force. So let's just talk about something just for the grins that's in the news. Afghanistan. Yeah. That's as news as you can get right now. That's as that's what's happening. How are we speaking about the Afghanis? Okay. How are we speaking about the Taliban? Does it help us to curse the Taliban? They all need Jesus. They all need Jesus. Okay? The Taliban have proven themselves to be the mo one of the most evil forms of anything to be on the planet to date. Well, let me ask you a question. Was there anybody in the Bible who was absolutely antagonistic to the gospel? Paul. Yeah. What was he? The head of persecution. He was the head of persecution for the Jewish religion. He was a top persecutor. God got a hold of him. What happened? Well, that kind of changed everything. That messed up everything for the people and the old Pharisees. It messed up everything, man. Perfect. Why don't we start finding, Lord, there is a head of persecution in the Taliban. Let's start praying blessing on him that he gets born again. What would happen if he had a close encounter with Jesus Christ? Like the heads of ISIS, he'd become a pastor. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of them have. Some of them have. And so this is, this is exactly what I'm getting at, is that let's not curse them. Let's bless them with revelation. Bless them with knowing Jesus. Bless them with that. Bless the Afghani people. They are right now in a really hurting place. Okay? To bless the, in, yeah, totally. How, and I was thinking about this one. This one kind of like blew my little head. And I was just thinking about this. It's like, wouldn't it be cool? I was looking at uh, Acts chapter two. That's a thing you should do once in a while. What would happen if the Holy Spirit truly fell in an amazing revival in Kabul? Oh, now see, that changes things. Yeah. Uh, what happens if everybody walking up to them hears God talking through people? Wouldn't that be cool? Can it be done? Absolutely. Love and lutely. What should we be praying? That. Okay. Praying these things. We've got to understand. we got to start blessing. Um, there is a person right now who is being highly, highly, highly cursed on a regular basis. His name is Anthony Fauci. If there's ever a man that needs to be blessed, with what? With truth. He needs Jesus. Okay? He needs exposure. Bless this whole thing with exposure to the light. In other words, be careful you're praying because you don't want to get into negative praying. That's called witchcraft. Yes. Don't do it. Okay? Everybody with me? Amen. Clunk. Nice ride. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for what you've done for us. Lord, you are mighty and awesome. And we just love you dearly for what you've done for us. Lord, you are you are the mighty God we serve. And we, we listen. Lord, may we hear you better and better. And Lord, I bless everybody within the sound of my voice. Everybody who hears this, who comes to this, Lord, I speak blessing that they could walk out of their curses and walk into the great power that you have for us and the blessing. We give you praise for all of this, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Questions? Comments? I thought for sure Chuck had a comment because he turned on his microphone. I forgot where it was.
fine. <laughs> All righty. Questions? Is this fun to go over again? I mean, this is we need to hear this once in a while, right? This is, even though you know we've heard this a few times, this is still vastly important that we get over this again and again and again. So, if I'm not mistaken, next week is our last on the helplessness. So we'll see what the Lord is doing. Um, yeah, there's something bigger, bigger. There's something big coming on next week that we're going to try to put all of this together and do a recap. That's what I'm looking at, unless the Lord gives me another topic. So we'll see. I always o leave my options open to <laughs> Jesus saying, oh, no, you're going here. Okay, let's go there. Okay. Y'all blessed? Yes. Okay. Well, amen. Let's see if I can not go here and start. Stop share. There we go. Well, uh, Heidi, I don't know if you got my um, got my message, but we have um, Mike here today, and we're going to be doing some singing. So I'd hope that you'd bake it down. Um, we're going to be doing some fun stuff. So anyway, I bless you. So Chuck, I bless you, sir. God bless you. Thank you all. And we'll talk to you all later. Okay. Wait till you guys see this. No, that's pretty. Wow. Somebody was standing at the right place at the right time. That was for a second it looked like uh, Jesus coming out of the tomb. That's exactly like, what I yeah, thought. I was like, right. whoa, wait. <laughs> So, pretty amazing. I want to... That's what the whole picture looks like. So, with all this down here, you know what this means? This means it's, it's a time lapse. Take a picture, it time lapses, and that you get that swirling on the water that way. So it might not have been a long time lapse, but it was there. And yes, there is something under <laughs> there. <laughs> Rocks. <laughs> so, anywho, how are you doing, folks? Good, thanks. Great.